Hi all, uh, Sam's a night chair. Um, I am an associate professor of philosophy at Purdue University Northwest. And today I plan on reading a paper that I've wrote entitled Justice Thomas, Abortion and the Way of Substantive Due Process. So I, I'm going to begin by describing what I plan to do. First, I should note that <clears throat> the talk today will not focus on the arguments for or against abortion. Certainly, this is a relevant topic because of the recent overruling of Roe and Casey by the Supreme Court in Dobbs versus Jackson. <clears throat> of course, I will talk about why the majority concludes that there's no constitutional substantive right to abortion. Second, although the majority members of the Supreme Court defend the view that there's no constitutional substantive right to abortion, my talk Today, we'll only focus on the concurring opinion of Justice Clarence Thomas. Like the main argument used by other members of the majority, Thomas concludes that the Due Process Clause does not secure the right to an abortion. <clears throat> that says, Thomas takes an extra step and argues that the Due Process Clause does not secure any substantive rights. At first glance, although this may not sound provocative, I intend to show how his viewpoint which in jeopardy other fundamental rights we take for granted, including the right to engage in private consensual sexual acts, the right to marry a person of the same sex, the right to marry a person of a different race, and many more cases. <clears throat> Third, in his opinion, Thomas gives three reasons why he believes that the due process clause does not secure any substantive rights. Today, my focus will only be on the first reason, I'll try to show why he thinks it's true, and then I will raise two objections against his reason. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so let's begin. Justice Thomas follows the majority in Dobbs by arguing that there's no constitutional right to abortion. But unlike the majority opinion, Justice Thomas argues that there's no right to, ab to abortion or any right which is justified by substantive due process. Justice Thomas's argument can be reproduced in the following manner. manner. Line one, if there's a constitutional substantive right to abortion, then the due process clause secures substantive rights, <clears throat> including the substantive right to abortion. Premise two, the due process clause does not secure any substantive rights. Therefore, there is no constitutional substantive right to abortion. To understand Th Justice Thomas's viewpoint better, I will only show today why he thinks premise two is true and why his argument might be sound. Let's turn now to premise two, namely, the due process clause does not secure any substantive rights. Why does Justice Thomas believe this is true? I'll begin this discussion with how Thomas's view of substantive due process compares to the majority and the dissent's opinions. After that, I will discuss Thomas's first reason to justify premise two. Justice Thomas is adamant about his view of substantive due process. He writes in his concurring opinion that, as I previously explained, substantive due process is an oxymoron that lacks any basis in the constitution. What is interesting to note is that the other justices, both the majority, except for Roberts and the dissent, have views about substantive due process, which is logically diametrically opposed to the viewpoint of Justice Thomas. For example, Justice Alito writes, we hold that Roe and Casey must be overruled. The constitution makes no reference to abortion and no such right is implicitly protected by any constitutional provision, including the one in which the defenders of Roe and Casey now chiefly rely the due press clause of the, of the 14th Amendment. That provision has been held to guarantee some rights that are not mentioned in the Constitution, but any such right <clears throat> must be deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. Here, Justice Alito implies that the due process clause has been used to reveal certain rights not enumerated in the Constitution as long as two provisios are met. The right is traceable back through our nation's cultural heritage, and it is implied by or consistent with the notion of ordered liberty. 
I will comment more on this issue. <clears throat> Justice Kavanaugh also concurs with this point. Kavanaugh writes, the text of the Constitution does not refer to or encompass abortion. To be sure, this court has held that the Constitution protects unenumerated rights that are deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition, but implicit in the concept and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. But our right to abortion is not deeply rooted in American history and tradition, as the court today thoroughly explains. Finally, the members of the dissent, Justices Breyer, Sotomayor, or Sudermeyer, uh, and Kagan also speak directly to the support of substantive due process. For example, speaking about the, about, uh, the Casey decision, the dissent includes another ruling decided by the Supreme Court. Central to the conclusion was a full-throated restatement of a woman's right to choose. Like Roe, Casey grounded this, that right in the 14th Amendment's guarantee of liberty. That guarantee encompasses realms of conduct not specifically referenced in the Constitution. Marriage is mentioned nowhere in that document, yet the court was no doubt correct to protect the freedom to marry against state interference. Again, referencing Casey, the dissent makes clear that not only was Roe decided by substantive due process, but it points to, to a Supreme Court decision six years earlier than Roe that also relied on substantive due process, namely Loving versus Virginia. The unanimous decision of Loving struck down laws banning interracial marriage. On this decision, the Casey majority writes, we have vindicated this principle before. Marriage is nowhere mentioned in the Bill of Rights and interracial marriage was illegal in most states in the 19th century. But the court was no doubt, fact, no, no doubt correct in finding it to be an aspect of liberty protected against state interference by the substantive component of the due process clause in Loving it versus Virginia. <clears throat> Finally, the dissent adds, the guarantee of liberty encompasses today conduct today that was not protected at the time of the 14th Amendment. It is settled now, the court said, though it was not always so, that the Constitution places limits on the state's right to interfere with the person's most basic decisions about family and parenthood, as well as bodily integrity. <clears throat> constitutional protection given to personal decisions relating to marriage, procreation, contraception, and family relationships. Now, as to Thomas's reasons for jettisoning the substantive due process doctrine, he makes clear that there are at least three reasons. First, substantive due process gives judges the right to make rules without a principled method to do so. Second, substantive due process interferes with other areas of constitutional law. Third, substantive due process has caused immeasurable harm. Again, I'm only going to discuss the first reason. Although there are three reasons for premise two, I only discuss the first one. This is Thomas's most serious objection to the substantive due process doctrine. Thomas grants that the doctrine has been used many times by the Supreme Court justices. However, he makes clear that method has failed to, as a procedure for the execution or evaluation for constitutional rights. The reason it has failed is that whereas it has been purported to identify fundamental rights, it has instead divined policies that are devoid of neutral legal analysis and which reflect the extra constitutional value preferences of the Supreme Court justices. At first glance, such an accusation is very serious. The reason is that Thomas's view is consistent with the legalistic theory of judicial decision making. Of this viewpoint, Epstein and Walker explained that justices are required to focus on the role of law, broadly defined, and legal methods in determining how justices interpret the Constitution, emphasizing, among other things, the importance of its words, American history and tradition, and precedent. Thus, to use extra constitutional value preferences, that is to use their own non-legal but moral personal beliefs, preferences, and desires, is to violate the legalistic theory of justice decision-making. 
To illustrate what he means, Thomas discusses three cases where the principle of substantive due process was used. What he tries to show is this, substantive due process is a jurisprudence devoid of a guiding principle. The cases, the cases are Roe, Casey, and the respondents of Dobbs. Concerning Roe, Thomas argues that the majority in Roe concluded that there is a fundamental right to abortion because the 14th Amendment's concept of liberty includes a right to privacy, which is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. Regarding Casey, Thomas makes clear that instead of moving from the concept of liberty to the right of privacy, he bypasses privacy and concludes that the right to abortion is derived from the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, of the mystery of human life. Finally, as Thomas explains, the respondents shift the focus away from privacy and defining one and own existence to bodily integrity, personal autonomy in matters of family, medical care, and faith. Right after this, without any further clarification, Thomas quickly concludes that 50 years have passed since Roe and abortion advocates still cannot coherently articulate the right or rights at stake proves the obvious. The right to abortion is ultimately a policy goal in desperate search of a constitutional justification. <clears throat> I will now turn to the critical assessment of Thomas's viewpoint for the elimination of substantive due process. My focus will be concerned with only his first reason for premise two. There are two parts of this discussion. First, I will consider the objections brought forth by the dissent, namely Justice Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. After that, <clears throat> I will add my own objections to this discussion. I will conclude that premise two is false and that Thomas's argument is unsound. <coughs> Excuse me. Although the dissent focuses on the troubling aspects of the majority opinion, for example, stare diseases, undue burden, and so forth, which includes some of Justice Thomas's concurring opinion, his argument against substantive due process is largely ignored. That said, they single Thomas out because of what he says about Supreme Court cases based on substantive due process. For example, the dissent singles out the majority's curious view that the reasons used to over, uh, overrule Roe and Casey should not cast doubt on other non-abortion pre precedents. For example, non-abortion precedents like Griswold, Lawrence, or Obergefell. The dissent counters by pointing out that the reasons used to overrule Roe and Casey could easily be used against the non-abortion precedents. Because of this possibility, the dissent levels a destructive dilemma against the majority. So one of two things must be true. Either the majority does not really believe in its own reasoning, or if it does, all rights that have no history stretching back to the middle 19th century are insecure. Either the mass of the majority's opinion is hypocrisy, or additional constitutional rights are under threat. It's one or the other. The same is not so when the dissent discusses Thomas. They are quick to make clear that Thomas agrees in part with the majority opinion, the ruling against Roe and Casey by the majority should not cast doubts on other non-abortion cases. However, as the dissent remarks, Thomas makes his intentions clear. Thomas writes, for that reason, in future cases, we should consider all of this court's substantive due process precedents, including Griswold, Lawrence, Obergefell, because any substantive due process decision is demonstrably erroneous. We have a duty to correct the error established in those precedents. Although Thomas's comments are worrisome, he follows his claim with a qualification. Thomas writes that once they are finished overruling cases that use substantive due process, for example, Griswold, Lawrence, Eisenstadt, Obergefell, and Loving, we could consider whether any of the rights announced in this court's substantive due process cases are privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States protected by the 14th Amendment. To do so, Thomas seems to indicate that this is no easy endeavor. For example, 
He writes, we would need to decide important antecedent questions, including whether the privileges or immunity clause protects any rights that are not enumerated in the Constitution, and if so, how to identify those rights. The attention to Thomas by the dissent does not resemble an objection per se. Rather, it represents a prediction of what to expect in the future from the current conservative members of the Supreme Court. Of the majority in general, then, the dissent forecasts that with the reasons used to strike down Rowan Casey will eventually be used to strike down Griswold, a right to privacy, Eisenstadt, the right of unmarried people to possess contraceptive, Lawrence, the right for consenting adults to make private sexual decision, Obergefell, the right of consenting adults to same-sex marriages and so forth. With Thomas, there's no doubt, especially if he gets his way. I turn now to consider my own objections that Justice Thomas uses to justify his view that the due process clause does not secure any substantive right. Briefly put, Thomas's first reason is that the substantive due process fails as a procedure to justify constitutional rights because it is devoid of neutral legal analysis. And as a result, the rulings in question, and in particular Roe, Casey, and the respondents of Dobbs, reflect the extra constitutional value preferences of the majority opinions. To assess at this point of view, we need to shed light on what substantive due process is about. Ultimately, my plan will be to show that substantive due process is a sound legal principle, which will help undermine the second and third reasons of Justice Thomas' argument. But is a discussion, but that is a discussion for another day. Our discussion begins with the notion of due process. Due process is described as, quote, the constitutional requirement that when the federal government acts in such a way that denies a citizen of life, liberty, or property interests, the person must be given notice, the, the opportunity to be heard, and a decision by a neutral decision maker. Procedural due process and substantive due process are the two, are the two of the components of due process. Quote, procedural due process is a principle that the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments protect fundamental rights from government interference. Specifically, the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments prohibit the government from depriving any person of life, liberty, or property without due process. The Fifth Amendment applies to federal action, and the Fourteenth applies to state action. Excuse me. All right. The court has also reckoned the due process guarantees of the fifth and 14th amendments to protect certain substantive rights that are not listed or enumerated in the constitution. The idea is that certain liberties are so important that they cannot be infringed without a compelling reason, no matter how much process is given. As a principal approach, at first glance, substantive due process looks like a slippery approach, approach to the establishment of fundamental rights. This is because as far as I know, nobody has stated what the principle should look like. Although I'm at a loss to state how it should read, maybe I can make a stab at one. So I call this the principle of substantive due process. X is a unenumerated fundamental right just in case one, X is deeply rooted in American history and tradition, or two, X is consistent with and circumscribed by evolving social norms, and maybe both one and two. Is this the principle that Justice Thomas wants to reject? Maybe, uh, maybe it is. Well, if it is, then as Thomas makes clear, it will generate policies which are devoid of neutral legal analysis and instead reflect the extra constitutional value preferences of the Supreme Court justices. As I understand, Thomas, the problem may be that the principle reads very much like the golden rule. The golden rule is the principle of treating others as one wants to be treated. For example, if you don't want others to lie to you, then it's wrong to lie to them. 
However, there are problems with the golden rule. One problem with the golden rule, according to Frank Feldman, is that it doesn't apply to actions which may be considered morally suspicious, for example, suicide. Feldman explains that when a person commits suicide, he does not treat others in any way, he only treats himself. Additionally, as Feldman makes clear, it permits and authorizes the unusual desires of masochists and so forth. Thus, to use the golden rule without a set of rules to guide how we should be treated opens up the extra moral value preferences that may be morally suspicious. If this is all that Thomas means about principle, then he may be right. But I wonder whether Thomas is correct. It is my understanding that when the principle is invoked, so to speak, it is summoned because of the threat of a series of serious harms that are deprivations, deprivations or harms that are inflictions to the life, liberty, property of the citizens of the United States. So from my own intuitions, it seems plausible that when the principle is guided against the backdrop of such deprivations or afflictions, it can maintain a neutral legal analysis as much as that is possible and restrain, restrain to some extent the possibility, possibilities of extra constitutional, extra constitution value preferences. Therefore, the following statement from Roe seems reasonable. The Constitution does not explicitly mention any right to privacy. In a line of decisions, however, the court has recognized that a right of personal privacy or a guarantee of certain areas or zones of privacy does exist under the Constitution. These decisions make it clear that only personal rights that can be deemed fundamental or implicit in the concept of ordered liberty are included in this guarantee of personal privacy. They also make clear that the right has some extension to activities re relating to marriage, procreation, excuse me, family relationships, and child rearing and education. There's something interesting about um, this quote. It speaks to what Thomas argues is mistaken from the, the principle I've generated or something like it, guided by the notion of ordered liberty, the fundamental right of per personal privacy is implicit, implied I mean. Um, from the notion of the fundamental right of personal privacy, other specific non-basic rights are deduced, which are related to the activities of marriage, procreation, family relationships, child rearing, and education. But the question still remains, does substantive due process fail as a procedure to justify constitutional rights? In Dobbs, Thomas believes it does because it's devoid of neutral legal analysis. Again, Thomas illustrates this point illustrates this by pointing out how different the majority opinions are to justify abortion, including the respondents and Dobbs. For example, Thomas points out that in Roe, the justices attempt to justify the right of a pre-viable abortion from the concept of personal privacy, which is itself inferred from the concept of liberty in the 14th Amendment. He continues to explain that instead of using privacy to defend the right to an abortion in Casey, the justices invoked an ethereal right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and the mystery of human life. Finally, Thomas complains the respondents and Dobbs include bodily integrity, personal autonomy in matters of family, medical care, and faith. Thomas's unspoken assumption seems to be that if the principle is true, and possesses neutral legal analysis, it would not guide the opinions of the justices in different ways. I have two responses to Thomas's view. First, contra Thomas, the principle works like it's supposed to work. This means that as a general legal principle, it has generated a number of important rights which are intuitive and necessary for a well-ordered society. Like the other justices, who overturned Roe and Casey, Thomas's singular commitment to overturn additional rights, for example, the right to privacy, same-sex marriage are in serious jeopardy. Second, there is an unspoken assumption about Thomas's view of the Supreme Court decision-making. One view 
of this discussion is called the legalistic theory of judicial decision making, and the other is called the realistic theory of judging. The former stipulates that judges, justices should interpret the Constitution in line with, say, the language of the text of the document or in accord with precedent. In order to do this, the justices are supposed to shed all of their personal biases, preferences, and partisan attachments while sitting on the bench. This is a normative count of, of judging. The latter approach suggests that justices do not shed their, these biases, preferences, and attachments while ruling on cases. This is a descriptive account of how judges actually rule. In my view, it is my view that part of justice's complaint of the principle is directed at the realistic element associated with the principle. More specifically, if the judge uses the uh, principle of substantive due process, then she cannot eliminate personal preferences altogether or apart from the personal or apart from the personal self-restraint she may exhibit, there's still too much room to allow extra constitutional, extra constitutional value preferences. Although it is my guess that this is what Justice Thomas has in mind, then he's correct. But such an admission does not give him the tide of victory. The reason is that it cannot be maintained that the justices can completely shed all their per personal preferences. Of course, because of the requirement of president and stare diseases and so forth, personal self-restraint is possible to a certain extent. That said, keeping in mind the Ninth Amendment, some need of personal preferences may be needed to secure unenumerated rights for ordered liberty. <clears throat> so in conclusion, today I've identified one reason why Roe and Casey were overturned. There is no constitutional substitute right of abortion because the due process clause does not secure a right to abortion. I also pointed out that while Justice Thomas agrees with this argument, he wants to take a more controversial position. He claims that the due process clause does not secure any substantive rights. As a result, as the dissent makes clear and Thomas himself admits, this puts in jeopardy um, potentially other fundamental rights, including the right to marry a person of a different race, the right to marry while in prison, the right, to, the right for married and single individuals to obtain contraceptives, the right to reside with relatives, the right to make decisions about education of one's children, the right to engage in private consensual sexual acts, the right to marry a person of the same sex, and many others. Finally, I attempted to bring two objections against Thomas's first reason for ditching the method of substantive due process. Namely, substantive due process is devoid of neutral legal analysis and as such allows justices to use extra constitutional value preferences. I argued that if we can identify a reasonable version of the principle of substantive due process and use it against the potential or real threat to the life, liberty, and property of US citizens, then it can maintain a neutral legal analysis as much as that is possible and restrain to some extent the possibilities of constitutional value preferences. Second, against the complaint of the different majority opinions, especially from Roe to Casey and to the respondents and Dobbs, the principle of substantive due process works like it's supposed to work. Namely, it has generated a number of fundamental rights which are intuitive and necessary for a well-ordered society. In the end, much more research is needed to shore up this discussion and to bring to light the right the right kind of method to generate fundamental rights which are not enumerated in the Constitution. 